Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 20th, 2022. I am Reverend Mary Tillman, an associate minister at Pleasant Green, and I will be the presenter of today's lesson. The fall quarter study is God's exceptional choice. We're in Unit 3, and the theme is, We Are God's Artwork. This is lesson number three in Unit 3. The lesson title in the Townsend Press Sunday School Commentary is, We Are God's Handiwork. And in the Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults, the lesson title is, Made for a Purpose. Our devotional reading, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Our background scriptures, Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7, Acts 19, Ephesians 2, and the print passage, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Our key verse is Ephesians 2 and 10. From the NIV Bible, it reads, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your holy word. Please open our minds so that we may learn and understand the purpose for our lives in you. This lesson teaches us that you expect good works from each of us. Thank you for loving us in spite of our disregard for the plan that you have for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Along with Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, Ephesians is one of Apostle Paul's prison epistles. Ephesians was written between A.D. 60 and A.D. 63 and is considered one of the greatest writings in the New Testament and probably written during Paul's first two-year imprisonment in Rome. And we find that in Acts chapter 28, verse 16. Paul had some of his greatest successes and greatest challenges during his two-year stay in Ephesus. It was during this two-year stay that the gospel expanded throughout the region of Asia, being the bridge leading to the founding of what became the seven churches of Asia Minor. You'll find that in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 10. Today's lesson shows how Paul reminds the Ephesians that because of their adoption and God's love and mercy, they are made alive through the saving power of Christ for the purpose of good works. Get your Sunday school book, your Bible, your pen, and a notepad, and follow along as we go forward with this wonderful lesson. Let's get started. The title of our lesson, Made for a Purpose. There are three questions for you to consider. Number one, how did Paul describe the lifestyles of everyone before they accepted Christ? Question number two, how are we saved? And question number three, what is God's spiritual purpose for you? Let's look at the lesson's biblical context. The message is simple. Paul explains to us humanity's previous sinful state before having Christ in our lives. He clarifies the meaning of salvation, and then he identifies God's divine purpose for the redeemed, those of us that are the true believers. Let's look at the aims for this week's lesson. They are, recognize the difference between a life of disobedience and trespass and a life of God's mercy and love. To experience assurance in knowing that God offers love, mercy, and grace on his own initiative. And respond to God's gifts of love, mercy, and grace with acts of service and compassion in the world. There are three lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each of them. The first outline is what we were, that's in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The second outline is what we are, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. And the third outline is what we are to do, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. Let's begin our analysis of the biblical text from the first outline. 
Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3 reads, and this will be from the NIV translation. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Key point number one. These verses of scripture reflects on who and what we were in the world before receiving or accepting the gift of salvation. Let me just point out right here that this lesson, although written to the church at Ephesus, he is still talking to us today. The word is relevant for today. It is apparent that Romans 3 and 23 was and is still true today that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This includes you. It includes me. It is evident that there is a desperate need for salvation through Christ. Without Christ, our soul is spiritually dead. As Paul explains in verse number one, those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord over their lives are just existing, but they're not really living. They're known as the walking dead. The worst death that one can experience is eternal death, which is total separation from God. God is the source of all life, and not to know him is to be dead spiritually. The Mississippi Mass Choir sings a song that said, It's good to know Jesus. Yeah, he's the lily of the valley, he's the bright and morning star, but everybody ought to know who Jesus is. We've heard about him, but you need to get to know him for yourself. Key point number two. In verses two and three, Paul identifies five characteristics of those who were spiritually dead. Number one, they lived according to the standards of the world, meaning that they loved and did the things that society permits without regard to the commandments of the Lord. When our whole life is governed by unholy ambitions, selfishness, greed, and the constant lust for things, we are being guided by the world's standards. See Romans 12 and 2. We won't go there, but read that in your spare time. Number two, spiritual death is characterized by a life controlled by Satan, referring to Satan's powers that are at work in the universe. We know that Satan is the one who stands over and for everything that God is against. Number three, spiritual disobedience. This is what Satan produces in the lives of the people who are not saved. He gives you a spirit of disobedience, which means regardless of what the Lord say, I'm going to go contrary or just the opposite, if you will of what I know to do that is right. Number four, lust of the flesh. And we know what that is. What I see is what I want. I want that. I want that. I want that. The Bible says the eyes of a man are never satisfied. So we need to watch what we lust after, what we want, what we feel like we deserve. And number five, our own selfish concerns. When nothing and no one else matters. Satan plays mind games with us when we begin to justify our own actions, thus becoming self-righteous. This represents a hopeless situation without divine intervention. Outline number two, what we are. And this is Ephesians chapter two, verses four through seven. And it reads, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. 
Key point number one, this makes me excited. Verse four brings a shift from wrath to grace, from hopelessness to redemption and life. It opens with the word, but. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had many, 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 but God moments in my life. And here in this text, we read yet another, but God situation. In this case, it is God's great love for us because he is rich in mercy. I want you to write that down somewhere. God is rich in mercy. Thank God for love, grace, and mercy. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is Romans 5 and 8. God's grace is one of his gifts to everyone that believes on the Son. Salvation begins with God. He alone is the author of salvation, and we can never be all that we can be without him. A life without Christ is like a ship without a sail. Key point number two. As a result of our new relationship with God through Jesus Christ, Paul notes that we have been given seats of honor in heavenly places. Not only will all believers see God's grace, but we will experience his kindness through Jesus Christ. Look at the benefits of giving up the pleasures of this world in exchange for the honor of having heavenly seating with Christ. It's better than getting a seating upgrade on an airline flight from coach to first class. Brothers and sisters, we cannot beat the benefits of living a life for Christ. Outline number three. What are we to do? Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. And it reads, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Key point number one. This is the heart of our lesson today. Paul stated that salvation was purely an act of God's grace. It meant God's undeserved favor. It is the act of God's grace based upon our faith that saves us. Nobody can save themselves. Romans 10 verses 8 through 13 says, But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That was Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 13. Since salvation is a gift from God. It cannot be earned by doing good works. Works play no part in salvation. However, Christians show evidence of the change in their lives by the good works that they do. We were created as new persons in Christ to do good works. It was already ordained that we should do good works. Key point number two. Every believer... Hear me, every believer is a unique masterpiece shaped and fashioned by God. Verse 10 sums it up. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are created in the image of God to do godly work. Psalm 139 gives a description of God's perfect knowledge of mankind. Verse 14 of Psalms 139 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well you need to thank god for making you the way that you are you are unique we are lively stones we are peculiar people no two people have the same identity there is something special about each of us thank god thank god for his created power to make each of us fearfully and wonderfully different marvelous are his works and we know that very well in summary humanity is the crown jewel of god's creative genius he spoke everything into existence except mankind read genesis the second chapter verse seven it is recorded that god formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being god takes messed up wretched worn out and beaten people and refashions them into new creatures who are his workmanship god has made each of us a work of art a creative masterpiece a one of a kind because of the sacrificial death of jesus and his resurrection from the dead this passage helps us understand why each of us is uniquely gifted to do what we do in his service when we come to god through our faith in the finished work of jesus christ at calvary we enter the realm of a new relationship jesus is now the lord of our lives one of the remarkable lessons from this passage is the truth that god is savior there is no sin from which god cannot forgive us this is the motivation for Christians to continue the magnificent work of evangelism and discipleship. Think about it. God has done a great work in each of us, and we must believe that he can do it in others. God can take anyone's life and do something miraculous in and with it. We must never give up on the lost men and women of our community, and we must never give up on those who are down and out. If God saved me, surely he can save anyone. I hope you got a thought from the lesson and you will realize your potential in being about the business for which you were created. What does God expect from you, from your life, as you go about making disciples for him? Let us pray. Father God, grant that we may never lose sight of the grace of the gift of salvation. Help us to be living testimonies of your grace and mercy and be examples of how you can use any and all of us to lead others to Christ. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I hope you got a thought from the lesson and happy Thanksgiving.